Mic check, testing, testing, mic check. I've been getting lost in the sauce, but we're back. We're reading How Not to Die. Um, no more distractions, no more diversions, no more d temptations. We're just jumping right in. Enough of me. We're reading How Not to Die, Chapter 11. How Not to Die from Breast Cancer. That's terrible. Who wants to die from breast cancer? Certainly not me. We're jumping right into it. You have breast cancer. These are among the most feared words a woman can hear, and for a good reason. Besides skin cancer, breast cancer is the most common cancer among American women. Every year, about 230,000 are diagnosed with breast cancer, and 40,000 die from it every year. God damn. Breast cancer does not occur overnight. That lump you feel in the shower one morning may have started forming decades ago. By the time doctors detect the tumor, it may have been present for 40 years or even longer. The cancer has been growing, maturing, and acquiring hundreds of new survival of the fittest mutations that allow it to grow even more quickly as it tries to outmaneuver your immune system. The scary reality is that what doctors call early detection is actually late detection. Modern imaging simply isn't good enough to detect cancer at its earliest stages, so it can spread long before it is even spotted. A woman is considered healthy until she shows signs or symptoms of breast, breast cancer, but if she has been harboring, harboring a malignancy, a M A L I G N A N C Y, malignancy, I'm going to annotate that word because that's a very beautiful word that I haven't heard before. Um, where was I? Harboring a malignancy for two decades. Can she truly be considered healthy? People who are doing the right thing by improving their diets in hopes of preventing breast cancer may in fact be successfully treating it as well. Autopsy studies have shown that as many as 20% of women aged 20 to 54 who died from unrelated causes, such as car accidents, had so-called occult or hidden breast cancer growing inside them. Sometimes, there's nothing you can do to prevent the, initi the initiation stage of cancer. When the first normal breast cell mutates into a cancerous one, some breast cancers may even start in the womb and be related to your mother's diet. Whoa, that's deep. For this reason, we all need to choose a diet and lifestyle that not only prevents the initiation stage of cancer, but also hampers the promotion stage during which the cancer grows to a size large enough to pose a threat. The good news is that no matter what your mom ate or how you lived as a child, by eating and living healthfully, you may be able to slow the growth rate of any hidden cancers. In short, you can die with your mother's tumors rather than from them. This is how dietary cancers prevention and treatment can end up being the same thing. One or two cancer cells never hurt anyone, but how about a billion cancer cells? That's how many 
may be in a tumor. By the time it's picked up by a mo by a mogram, by a mammogram, sorry, mammogram, yep. Like most tumors, breast cancer starts with just one cell, which divides to become two, four, and then eight. Every time breast cancer cells divide, the tumor can effectively double in size. Let's see how many times a tiny tumor has to double to get to a billion cells. Take out a calculator, multiply one times two, then multiply that number by two. Keep doing that until you reach one billion. Don't worry, it won't take long. It's only 30 doublings. In just 30 doublings, a single cancer cell can turn into a billion. The key to how quickly you'd be diagnosed with cancer, then, is the doubling time. How long it takes tumors to double once. Breast cancer can double in size anywhere from as few as 25 days to 1,000 days or more. In other words, it could be two years, or it could be more than 100 years before a tumor starts to cause problems. Where you fall on that time scale, two years or a century, may depend on in part, on what you eat. When I was a teen, I ate a lousy diet. One of my favorite meals, no joke, was chicken fried steak. During my youth, I, have, I may have caused one of the cells in my colon or prostate to mutate, but I've been eating much healthier for the last 25 years. My hope is that even if I did initiate the cancerous growth, if I don't promote it, I may be able to slow down its growth. I don't care if I get diagnosed with cancer 100 years from now. I don't expect to be around at that point to worry about it. Current controversy over the cost and effectiveness of mammograms. Misses an, miss, sorry, misses an important point. Breast cancer screening, by definition, does not prevent breast cancer. It can just pick up existing breast cancer. Based on autopsies, Vent breast cancer, it can, oh sorry, based on autopsies, studies as many as 39% of women in their 40s already have breast cancers growing within their bodies. That may be simply too small to be detected by mammograms. That's why you can't just wait until diagnosis to start eating and living healthier. You should start tonight. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. No one can predict the future. Only time will tell. Any other way. Risk factors for breast cancer. The American Institute for Cancer Research, AIR, no, AICR, is considered one of the world's leading authorities on diet and cancer. Based on the best available research, it came up with 10 recommendations for cancer prevention. Beyond never chewing tobacco, their bottom line dietary message was diets that revolve around whole plant foods vegetables, whole grains, fruits, and beans cut the risk of many cancers and other diseases as well. To demonstrate how dramatically lifestyle choices can impact breast cancer risk, over the course of about seven years, researchers followed a group of about 30,000 postmenopausal women postmenopausal women with no history of breast cancer, achieving just three of the 10 AICR recommendations, limiting alcohol, eating mostly plant foods, and maintaining a normal body weight, was associated with a 62% lower risk of breast cancer. Yes, three simple health behaviors appeared to cut risk by more than half. Remarkably, eating a plant-based diet along with walking every day can improve your cancer defenses with just two weeks. Researchers dripped Drip the blood of women before and after 14 days of healthy living into onto breast cancer cells growing in petri dishes. The blood taken after they started eating healthier suppressed cancer growth significantly better and killed 20 to 30 percent more cancer cells than the blood taken from the same women just two weeks before. The researchers attributed this effect to the decrease in levels of a cancer promoting growth hormone called IGF 1 likely due to the reduced intake of animal protein, what kind of blood do you want in your body? What kind of immune system? The kind of blood that just rolls over when new cancer cells pop up, or blood that circulates to every nook and cranny in your, in your body with the power to slow down and stop cancer cells in their track. Alcohol. In 2010, the official World Health Organization 
body that assesses cancer risk formally upgraded its classification of alcohol to a definitive human breast carcinogen. In 2014, it's clarified its position by stating that regarding breast cancer, no amount of alcohol is safe, but what about drinking responsibly? In 2013, scientists published a compilation of more than 100 studies on breast cancer and light drinking, up to one alcohol, alcoholic beverage a day. The researchers had found a small but statistically significant increase in breast cancer risk, even among women who had at most one drink per day, except perhaps for red wine. See box below. They estimated that every year around the world, nearly 5,000 breast cancer deaths may be attributed to light drinking. The carcinogen isn't alcohol itself. The culprit, it's actually the toxic breakdown product of alcohol called acetyl acid these big words man i swear a c e t a l d e h y d e acetaldehyde acetaldehyde that's what we're going to pretend it sounds like which can form in your mouth almost immediately after you take a sip experiments show that even holding a single t- tablespoon excuse me even holding a single teaspoon of hard liquor in your mouth for five seconds before spitting it out results in the production of potentially carcinogenic carcinogenic genic levels of acetaldehyde acetaldehyde whatever it's called that that lingers for more than 10 minutes if even a single sip of alcohol might produce cancer causing levels of acetaldehyde blah 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 in the mouth what about using mouthwash what contain that contains alcohol Researchers who tested the effects of a variety of retail mouthwashes and oral rinses concluded that although the risk is slight, it is probably best to refrain from using such products if they contain alcohol. Interesting. Is he telling us not to use mouthwash? Hmm. I might want to look into that. Red wine versus white wine. The Harvard Nurses Health Study found that even less than one drink a day may be associated with small increase in breast cancer risk. Interestingly, drinking only red wine was not associated with breast cancer risk. Why? A compound in red wine appears to suppress the activity of an enzyme called estrogen synthesis. Synthes. S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. Which which breast tumors can use to create estrogen to fuel their own growth. This compound is found in the skin of the dark purple grapes used to make red wine, which explains why white wine appears to provide no such benefit, since it's, pro- since it's produced without the skin. The researchers concluded that red wine may ameliorate... Sorry, these words, man. They're not easy. A-M-E-L-I-O-R-A-T-E. Ameliorate the elevated breast cancer risk associated with alcohol intake. In other words, the grapes and red wine may help cancel out some of the cancer-causing effects of the alcohol, but you can reap the benefits without the risk associated with imbibing alcohol beverages by simply drinking grape juice. Or even better, eating the <laughs> eating the purple grapes themselves, preferably ones with seeds, as they appear to be most effective at suppressing estrogen synthesis. It's good and delicious to know that strawberries, prom- pomegranates, and plain white mushrooms may also suppress the potentially cancer-promoting enzyme, and that, my friend, is good enough grounds to get a sticky note. Page 182, Melatonin and Breast Cancer Risk. Four billion, four billions of years, not the number four, but just four billions of years. Um, life on planet Earth evolves under conditions of about 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Humans controlled fire for cooking about a million years ago, but we've only been using candles for about 5,000 years and electric lights for a merely century. In other words, our ancient ancestors lived half their lives in the dark. Spooky. 
these days. Though, because of the electric light pollution at night, the only Milky Way our children may see inside a candle wrap is inside a can a candy wrapper. That's unfortunate. Electric lighting has enabled us to remain productive well into the wee hours, but might this unnatural nighttime light exposure have any adverse health effects? In philosophy, let's go philosophy! That's my major. There's a flawed argument called the appeal to nature fallacy. Ooh, I've heard of this, but it's still getting a sticky note. The appeal to nature fallacy, in which someone proposes that something is good merely because it's natural. In biology, however, this may hold some truth. The conditions under which our bodies were finely tuned over millions of years can sometimes give us insight into our optimal optimal functioning. For example, we evolved running around naked in equatorial equatorial Africa therefore equatorial equator IAL whatever therefore it's not surprising that many of us modern humans become deficient in vitamin D the sunshine vitamin if we live in northern climes C L I M E S or in countries where the culture dictates full body coverings for women, could something as ubiquitous as the light bulb be a mixed blessing? Right in the middle of your brain sits the pineal gland, your so-called third eye. It's connected to your actual eye, is connected to your actual eyes and has just one function, to produce a hormone called melatonin. During the day, the pineal gland is inactive, but once the sky darkens, it activates and begins pumping melatonin into your bloodstream. You start getting tired, feel less alert, and start thinking about sleep. Melatonin secretion may peak between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Also, it said it only has one function, and that's to create melatonin. I thought it secreted other hormones as well, but um, let's, let's uh, look into that further, shall we? Um, feel less alert and start thinking about sleep. Melatonin starts getting tired, feel less alert, blah, blah, blah. Get to it. Here we go. Secretion may peak between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. and then shuts off at daybreak, which is your cue to wake up. The level of melatonin in your bloodstream is one of the ways your internal organs knows what time it is. It functions as one hand on your circadian clock. Besides helping to regulate your sleep, Melatonin is thought to play another role, suppressing cancer growth. Think of melatonin as helping to put cancer cells to sleep at night. To see if this function applies to preventing breast cancer, researchers from Brigham and the Women's Hospital in Boston and elsewhere came up with the cancer idea of studying blind women. The thought was that because blind women can't see sunlight, their pineal glands never stop, secreting melatonin into their bloodstreams. Sure enough, the researchers found that bl- blind women may have just half the odds of breast cancer as sighted women. Con- Conversely, women who interrupt their melatonin production by working night shifts appear to be at increased risk for breast cancer. Even living on a particularly brightly lit street may affect the risks. Studies comparing nighttime satellite photos against breast cancer rates have found that people living in brighter neighborhoods tend to have higher breast cancer risk. Therefore, it's probably best to sleep without any lights on and with the blinds down. Though the evidence to support these strategies is limited, melatonin production can be gauged by measuring the amount of melatonin excreted in our first pee in the morning. And indeed, women with higher melatonin secretion have been found to have lower risk rates of breast cancer. Other than minimizing nighttime light exposure, is there anything else you can do to keep up your production of melatonin? Apparently, apparently so. In 2005, Japanese researchers reported an association between higher vegetable intake and lower melatonin levels in the urine. Is there anything in your diet that may lower melatonin production, thereby potentially increasing breast breast cancer risk? 
We didn't know until a comprehensive study of a diet and melatonin was published in 2009. Researchers at Harvard University asked nearly a thousand women about their consumption of 38 different foods or food groups and measured their morning melatonin levels. Meat consumption was the only food significantly associated with lower melatonin production for reasons that are yet unknown. Minimizing melatonin disruption may therefore mean putting curtains on your windows, eating more vegetables, and lowering the curtain on eating too much meat. I suppose that deserves a sticky note. Exercise and breast cancer. Here we go, boys, ladies, and gentlemen. Physical activity is considered a promising preventative measure against breast cancer, not only because it helps with weight control, but because exercise tends to lower circulating estrogen levels. Five hours a week of vigorous aerobic exercise can lower estrogen and pro... pro this word, man, this big word. Progesterone. P-R-O-G-E-S-T-E-R-O-N-E. -E. Progesterone exposure by about 20%. But do you need to work at, a, at that long for it to be protect, protective? Although, even light exercise is associated with lower risk of some other types of cancer for breast cancer, leisurely strolls don't appear to cut it. Even an hour a day of activities such as slow dancing or light housework may not help. According to the largest study ever published on the subject, only women who worked up a sweat at least five or more times a week appeared to get significant protection. Moderate Moderate and moderately intense activity may offer as much benefit as vigorous exercise, though walking at a moderate pace for an hour a day is considered a moderately intense level of exercise, but it wasn't put into the test until 2013 study reported, reported that indeed walking an hour a day or more is associated with significantly lower breast cancer risk. Darwin was right. It's survival of the fittest. So get fit. Let's go. Heteroceliac amines. That's not how you pronounce that, but I'll spell it for you. H e t e r o c y c l i c, and the next word is amines. A m i n e s. It's definitely not pronounced that, but we're moving forward. Nonetheless, in 1939, a curious finding was published in a paper titled Presence of Cancer, Producing Substances in Roasted Food. A researcher described how he could induce breast cancer in mice by painting their hands, oh no, sorry, by painting their heads with extracts of roasted horse muscle. Interesting. These cancer-producing substances have since been identified as heterocelic and aminis, <clears throat> HCAs described by the National Cancer Institute as chemicals formed when muscle meat inducing beef, pork, fish, and poultry is cooked using high temperature methods. These cooking methods include roasting, pan frying, grilling, and baking. Eating boiled meat is probably the safest. People who eat meat that never goes above 212 degrees Fahrenheit produce urine and feces that are significantly less DNA damaging compared to those eating meat dry cooked at higher temperatures. And that, my friend, is getting a, a, a sticky note. Here we go. Jumping right into it. Good to know. This means they have fewer mutagenic genetic substances flowing through their bloodstreams and coming in contact with their colons. On the other hand, baking chicken for as few as 15 minutes at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit leads to HCA production. These carcinogens are formed in a high temperature chemical reaction between excuse me, some of the components of muscle tissue. 
the lack of some of these substances in plants may explain why even fried veggie burgers don't contain measurable HCAs. The longer meat is cooked, the more HCAs is formed. This process may explain why eating well-done meat is associated with increased risk of cancer of the breast, colon, esophagus, lung, pancreas, prostate, and stomach. The situation creates what the Harvard Health Letter called a meat preparation paradox. Cooking meat thoroughly reduces the risk of contraction, foodborne infections, see chapter 5, but cooking meat too thoroughly may increase the risk of foodborne carcinogens. Just because heterocelic amines causes cancer in rodents doesn't mean they cause cancer in humans. In this case, though, it turns out people may be even more susceptible. The livers of rodents have shown an uncanny ability to detoxify 99% of the HCAs scientists stuffed down the animals' throats, a technique known as gavage. That's getting a sticky note. Okay. Gavage. But then, in 2008, researchers discovered that the livers of humans fed cooked chicken were only able to detoxify about half of these carcinogens, suggesting that the cancer risk is far higher than was previously thought based on experiments in rats. The carcinogens found in cooked meat are thought to explain as the Long Island Breast Cancer Study projected project report reported in 2007 women who eat more grilled barbecued or smoked meats over their lifetimes may have a 47 percent higher odds of breast cancer and the iowa women's health study found that women who ate their bacon beef steak and burgers very well done had nearly five times the odds of getting breast cancer compared with women who preferred these meats served rare or medium. To see what was happening inside the breast, researchers asked women undergoing breast reduction surgery about their meat cooking methods. The scientists were able to link the consumption of fried meat with the amount of DNA damage found within the women's breast tissue. The type of damage that can potentially cause a normal cell to mutate into a cancer cell, HCAs appear able both to initiate and promote cancer growth. PHIP, one of the most abundant HCAs in cooked meat, was found to have potent estrogen-like effects fueling human breast cancer cell growth almost as powerfully as pure estrogen, one which most human breast tumors thrive but that result was based on research in a petri dish. How do we know what that cooked meat carcinogens find their way into human breast ducts, where most breast cancers arise? We didn't until researchers measured the levels of PHIP in the breast milk of non-smoking women. HCAs were also found in cigarette smoke. In this study, PHIP was found in the breast milk of women who ate meat at the same con concentration known significantly to boost breast cancer cell growth. No trace of PHIP was found in the breast milk of the one veg vegetarian participant. A similar finding was reported in a study comparing the levels of PHIP in people's hair. The chemical was detected in hair samples of all six of the meat eaters tested, but in only one of the six vegetarians. HCAs can also be found in fried eggs. Your body can rapidly rid itself of these toxins once exposure ceases. In fact, urine levels of PHIP can drop to zero within 24 hours of refraining from eating meat. So if you practice meatless Mondays, the level of PHIP passing through your body may become undetectable by Tuesday morning. But diet is not the only source of PHIP. HCA levels in vegetarians who smoke may approach those of non-smoking meat eaters. The hydrocyliac amine PHIP is not just so-called complete carcinogen able to both initiate Oh, it's not just a so-called complete carcinogen able to initiate cancers and then promote their growth. PHIP may also facilitate cancer spread. 
Cancer develops in three major stages. One, initiation, the re ir irreversible DNA damage that starts the process. Two, promotion, the growth and division of the initiated cell into a tumor. And three, progression, which can involve the invasion of the tumor into the surrounding tissue and meta metastasis spread to the other areas of the body. And that is definitely getting a sticky note. Scientists can test how invasive or aggressive a certain cancer is by putting its cells into an instrument called an invasion chamber. They place cancer cells on one side of a pro porous membrane and then gauge their ability to penetrate and spread through the membrane. When researchers place med metatastic breast cancer cells from a 54-year-old woman into an invasion chamber all by themselves, relatively few were able to breach the barrier. But within 72 hours of adding PHIP to the chamber, the cancer cells became more invasive, crawling through their membrane at an accelerated rate. PHIP in meat may therefore represent a three strikes you're out type of cancer carcinogen, potentially involved in every stage of brand cancer breast cancer development. Staying away from the stuff isn't easy, though eating the standard American through eating the standard American diet. As the researchers note, exposure to PHIP is difficult to avoid because its pr presence in many commonly consumed cooked meats, particularly chicken, beef, and fish. Cholesterol. Remember, earlier when we discussed the American Institute for Cancer Research, a study found that Following its guidelines for cancer prevention appeared to reduce not just breast cancer risk, but also heart disease risk. What's more, not only may eating healthier to prevent cancer help to prevent heart disease, but eating to prevent heart disease may also help to prevent cancer. One of those reasons, cholesterol may help play a role in the development and progression of breast cancers. Sorry. One of the reasons... Cholesterol may play a role in the development and progression of breast cancer. Cancer appears to feed on cholesterol. LDL cholesterol stimulates the growth of breast cancer cells in a petri dish. They just gobble up the so-called bad cholesterol. Tumors may s suck up so much cholesterol that cancer patients' cholesterol levels tend to plummet as their cancer grows. This is not a good sign as patient survival tends to be lowest when cholesterol uptake is highest. And that is definitely getting a sticky note. The cancer is thought to be using the cholesterol to make estrogen or to shore up tumor membranes to help the cancer migrate and invade more tissue. In other words, breast tumors may take advantage of high circulating cholesterol levels to fuel and accelerate their own growth. Cancer's hunger for cholesterol is such that pharmaceutical companies have considered using LDL cholesterol as a Trojan horse to deliver anti-tumor drugs to cancer cells. Whoa. Though data have been mixed, the largest study on cholesterol and cancer to date, including more than a million participants, found a 17% increase risk in women who had a total cholesterol level over 240 compared with, compared with women whose cholesterol was under 160. If lowering cholesterol may help lower breast cancer risk, what about taking cholesterol-lowering statin drugs? Statins look promising in petri dish studies, but population studies comparing breast cancer rates among statin users and non-users showed in inconsistent results. Some suggested statins, 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 however you want to pronounce it, decrease breast cancer risk, while others showed increased risk. Nearly all these studies were relatively short term. However, most considered five years to be long-term statin use, but breast cancer can take decades to develop. The first, <clears throat> excuse me, the first major study on the breast cancer risk of statin use 
for 10 years or longer was published in 2013. It found that women who had been taking statins for a decade or more had twice the risk of both common types of infiltrating breast cancer, invasive ductal carcinoma, whoa, invasive D-U-C-T-A-L ductal C-A-R-C-I-N-O-M-A carcinoma, and invasive lubular carcinoma. The cholesterol drugs doubled the risk. If confirmed, the public health implications of these findings are immense. Approximately one in four women in the United States over the age of 45 may be taking these drugs. The number one killer of women is heart disease, not breast cancer. So women still need to bring down their cholesterol. You can likely achieve this without drugs by eating a healthy enough plant-based diet. And certain plant foods may be particularly protective. Preventing and treating breast cancer by eating plants. Not long ago, I received a very moving note from Bet Betina. B-E-T-T-I-N-A, a woman who had been following my work on nutritionalfacts.org. Betina had been diagnosed with stage 2 triple negative breast cancer, the hardest type to treat. She underwent 8 months of treatment, including surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. A breast cancer diagnosis is stressful enough. But the anxiety and depression can be compounded by this type of rigorous cancer regimen. Betina, however, used the experience to make a positive change to make positive changes in her life. After watching a number of my videos, she started to eat healthier. She followed many of my, the recommendations you'll find in this chapter for helping to prevent the reoccurrence of cancer, such as this is getting a sticky note already. I already know. Such as eating more broccoli and flax seeds. The good news, Betina has been cancer free for more than three years now. Let's go. Given all the studies I've read through, it's easy for me to forget that the statistics refer to people's lives. Stories like Betina's helped me put faces to all the dry facts and figures. When real people make real changes, they can see real results. Sadly, even after a breast cancer diagnosis, most women may not make the dietary changes that could help them most, such as consuming less meat and more fruits and vegetables. Maybe they don't realize, or their doctors never told them, that a healthier lifestyle may improve their survival chances. For example, a study of nearly 1,500 women found that remarkably simply behavior changes, such as eating just five or more servings of fruits and veggies per day, and veggies per day, along with walking for 30 minutes six days a week, were associated with a significant survival advantage. Those who followed these recommendations appeared to have nearly half the risk of dying from their cancer in the two years following diagnosis. While stories like Betina can help make these statistics more inspiring, it all has to come back to the science. Over time, what to eat and feed our families are life or death decisions. How else can we decide but based on the best available balance of evidence? Fiber. Inadequate fiber consumption may also be a risk factor for breast cancer. Researchers at Yale University and elsewhere found that fin this is premenopausal women who ate more than about 6 grams of soluble fiber a day, the equivalent of about a single cup of black beans, had 62% lower odds of breast cancer compared with women who consumed less than around 4 grams a day. Fiber's benefits appeared even more pronounced for estrogen receptor negative breast tumors, which are harder to treat. Premenopausal women on high fiber diets had 85% lower odds of that type of breast cancer. How did the researchers arrive at these figures? The Yale study was found was what's called a case control study. Scientists compared the past diets of women who called a case control study. Sorry, 
Scientists compared the past diets of women who had breast cancer, the cases, to the past diets of similar women who did not have breast cancer, the controls, to try to tease out if these, if there is something distinctive about eating habits of women who developed these diseases. The researchers found that certain women with breast cancer reported eating... Sorry, that deserves a sticky note. So we're going to get our handy-dandy sticky note, and we're going to mark this page because... Eat, eat freaking black beans, I guess. Black beans, a couple black beans a day, why not? Reported eating significantly less soluble fiber on average than the cancer-free women. Hence, soluble fiber may be protective. The women in the study weren't getting their fiber from supplements, though they were getting it from food. But this could mean that eating more fiber is merely evidence that the cancer-free women are eating more plant foods. The only place fiber is found naturally, therefore, fiber itself might not be the active ingredient. Maybe there's something else protective in plant foods. On the other hand, noted the researchers, an increased consumption of fiber from foods of plant origin may reflect a reduced consumption of foods of animal origin. In other words, maybe it's not what they were eating more of, but what they were eating less of. The reasons high fiber intake is associated with less breast cancer may be because of more beans or less bologna. Interesting. Either way, an analysis of a dozen other breast cancer case control studies reported similar findings with lower breast cancer risk association with indicators of fruit and vegetable intake, such as vitamin C intake and higher breast... <clears throat> Excuse me such as vitamin C intake and higher breast cancer risk association, with higher saturated fat intake, an indicator of meat, dairy, and processed food intake. And according to these studies, the more whole plant foods you eat, the better it is for your health. Every 20 grams of fiber intake per day was associated with a 15% lower risk of breast cancer. And that, my friend, is getting a what? It's getting a sticky note. Sorry. It's, it's happening. There's no other way. 15% lower risk of breast cancer. One problem with case control studies, though, is that they, are, they rely on people's memory of what they've been eating, potentially introducing what's known as recall bias. For example, if people with cancer are more likely to selectively remember more of the unhealthier things they ate, this skewed recall could artificially inflate the correlation between eating certain foods and cancer. Perspective Cohort studies avoid this problem by following a group, cohort, or healthy women and their diets forward prospectively in time to see who gets cancer and who doesn't. A compilation of 10 such prospect cohort studies on breast cancer and fiber intake came up with similar results to the dozen case control studies mentioned above. A 14% lower risk of breast cancer for every 20 grams of fiber intake per day. The relationship between more fiber and less breast cancer may not be a straight line, be a straight line though breast cancer risk may not significantly fall until at least 25 grams of fiber a day is reached. Unfortunately, the average American woman appears to eat less than 15 grams of fiber a day. That is unfortunate. Only about half the minimum daily recommendation. Even the average vegetarian in the United States may only get about 20 grams daily. Healthier vegetarians, though, may average 13 to set 37 grams of day a day and vegans 46 grams daily. Meanwhile, the whole food plant-based diets used therapeutically to reverse chronic disease contain upward of 60 grams of fiber. <sighs> Peeling back breast cancer. Does an apple a day keep the oncologist away? O N C O L O G I S T. This was the title of a study published in the Annals of Oncology that set out to determine if eating an apple or more a day was associated with lower cancer risks. The results compared with people who averaged less than one apple a day 
daily apple eaters had 24% lower odds of breast cancer, as well as significantly lower risk of ov 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 ovarian cancer. O v a r i a n ovarian cancer, Laryn laryngeal cancer, Larry L a r y n g e a l laryngeal cancer, and colorectal cancer. The protective associations persisted even after considering these subjects' intake of vegetables and other fruits, suggesting daily apple consumption was more than just an indicator of eating a healthier diet. The cancer protection apples appear to offer is appear to offer is assumed to arise from their antioxidant pr properties. Apple antioxidants are con concentrated in the peel. Interesting. Which makes sense. The skin is the fruit's first line of defense against the outside world. Exposure, the inner flesh, and it starts to brown, oxidizes with moments. The antioxidant power of the peel may be between two times golden delicious to six times endured greater than the pulp. Well, that's getting a sticky note. I don't know if those are types of apples or what, but golden delicious. I-D-A-R-E-D, -E greater the pulp. Beyond protecting against the initial free radical hit to your DNA, apple extract has been shown to suppress the growth of both estrogen receptor positive and negative breast cancer cells in a petri dish. When researchers at my alma mater, Cornell University, separately dripped extracts of peel and flesh from the same apples on cancer cells, the peel stopped cancer growth 10 times more effectively. Researchers found something in the peels of organic apples, presumably present in conventional ones as well, that appears to reactivate the tumor suppressors gene called Massapin, an acronym for mammary serine protease inhibitor. Massapin Massapin is one of the tools your body appears to use to keep breast cancer at bay. Breast cancer cells find a way to turn off this gene, but apple peels appear to be able to turn it back on. The researchers concluded that apple peels should not be discarded from the diet. I'm like allergic to apple peels, which sucks. I mean, I get like this, this, this like raspy, like, ugh, in my throat, and it's just like, the worst. I might blend it up in a smoothie though. That might be better. Preventing breast cancer by any greens necessary. I like that section title. Earlier, I discussed the 2000 study of Long Island women that linked breast cancer risk to the hydrosolic anamines found in meat. Older women consuming the most grilled barbecued or smoked meat over their lifetimes were found to have a 47% increased odds of breast cancer. Those with high meat intake who also had low fruit and vegetable intake had a 74% higher odds. Low fruit and vegetable intake may just be a sign of unhealthy habits overall, but increased evidence suggests that there are many... Oh, by the way, I'm annotating this page as well. Annotation, sticky notes. Here we go. Evidence suggests that they are that there may be something in pro, in produce that is actively protective against breast cancer. For example, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli boost the activity of detoxifying enzymes in your liver. Basically, eat more broccoli, guys. Researchers has shown that if you feed people broccoli and Brussels sprouts, they clear caffeine. They clear caffeine more quickly, meaning that if you eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables, you'd have to drink more coffee to get the same buzz because your liver, the body's purifier, has become so revved up. Might this process work for those cooked meat carcinogens as well? To find out, researchers fed a group of non-smokers pan-fried meat. They then measured the levels of hydrosilic am amines circulating in their body bodies by sampling their urine. For two weeks, the study subjects added about three cups of broccoli and Brussels sprouts to their diet, daily diets and then ate the same meat meal. Though they consumed the same 
quantity of carcinogens significantly less came out in their urine, consistent with the subject's broccoli-boosted liver detox detoxability. What happened next was unexpected. The subjects stopped eating their veggies and, two weeks later, tried eating the meat meal again. Presumably, their ability to detox carcinogens would by then have reverted back down to baseline. But instead, the subject's liver function remained enhanced even weeks later. This finding suggests that not only might a helping side of broccoli with your steak decrease carcinogen exposure, but that eating your veggies day or even weeks before the big barbecue may help shore up your defenses. Choosing the veggie burger may be the safest choice, though it may have no heterocyclic amines to detoxify. So, why are women who eat a lot of green vegetables less likely to get breast cancer? A study of 50,000 African American women, a sadly neglected demographic in medical research, but a population group who tends to regularly eat more greens, found that those who ate two or more servings of vegetables a day had significantly decreased risk of a kind of breast cancer that's hard to treat. Estrogen and pro progesterone receptor negative Broccoli appeared especially protective among premenopausal women, but collard green consumption was associated with less breast, or less breast cancer risk at all ages. Breast cancer stem cells. Here we go. Interesting. I'm running out of space on my computer. Nonetheless, here we go. Breast cancer stem cells. What if you're already fighting breast cancer or in remission? Green vegetables may be may still be protective over the past decade. Scientists have found have been developing a new theory of cancer biology based on the role of stem cells. Stem cells are essentially the body's raw materials, the parents from which all other cells with specialized functions are generated. As a result, stem cells are a critical component of the body's repair system, including regrowing skin, bone, and muscle. Breast tissues naturally has m many stem cells in reverse, which are used during pregnancy to create new milk glands. However, as miraculous as stem cells are, their immortality can also work against us. Instead of rebuilding organs, if they turn cancerous, they can build tumors. Cancerous stem cells may be why breast cancer can return even up to 25 years after being fought off successfully the first time. When people are told that they are cancer-free, it may mean their tumors are gone. But if their cells are cancerous, the tumors still might re reappear many years later. Sadly, someone who has been cancer-free for 10 years might consider herself cured, but actually may just be in remission. Smoldering cancer stem cells may be just waiting to reignite. I'm unfortunately going to give that a sticky note. The current battery of sophisticated chemo drugs and radiation regimens is based on animal models. Success of a given treatment is often measured by its ability to shrink tumors in rodents, but rats in laboratories only live for about two or three years in any case. Doctors may be shrinking tumors, but mutated stem cells may be lurking, able to slowly rebuild new tumors over the ensuing years. What we need to do is strike at the root of cancer. We need to devise treatments aimed not just at reducing tumor bulk, but at targeting what has been called the beating heart of the tumor. Cancer stem cells, that's where broccoli may come in. Sulf sulforaphane, a dietary component of cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, has been shown to surpass the ability of breast cancer stem cells to form tumors. This means that if you are currently in remission, eating lots of broccoli could theoretically help keep your cancer from returning. I say theoretically because those results were from a petri dish. To be useful as a cancer fighter, sulforaphane may have to be first absorbed into your bloodstream when you eat broccoli. Then it would have to build up at the same concentration in breast tissue found to counter cancer stem, to counter cancer stem cells in the lab. Is that possible? 
An innovative group at Johns Hopkins University sought to fi- find out the researchers asked women scheduled for a breast reduction surgery to drink broccoli sprout juice an hour before their pr- produ- pr- procedure. Sure enough, after dissecting their breast tissue post-surgery, the researchers found evidence of significant sulforaphane buildup. In other words, we now know that the cancer-fighting nutrients in broccoli do find their way to the right place when we swallow them. To reach the concentration of sulforaphane in the breast found to suppress breast cancer stem cells. However, you would have to eat at least a quarter cup of broccoli sprouts a day. You can buy broccoli sprouts in the produce aisle, but they are cheap and easy to grow at home. They have a bit of a radishy bite to them, so I like to mix them with into a salad to dilute their intensity. There have yet to be randomized clinical trials to see if breast cancer survivors who eat broccoli live longer than those who don't. But, with no downside and only positive side effects, eating broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables is something I would recommend for everyone. Flax seeds! Almost done, guys. Flax seeds are one of the first items ever considered to be health foods. Treasured for their purported purported healing properties since at least the time of ancient Greece. When when the renowned physician Hippocrates wrote about using them to treat patients. Interesting. Better known as one of the richest plant sources of Essential omega-3 fatty acids, flax seeds are really set apart by their lignin content. Though lignins are found throughout the plant kingdom, flax seeds have around 100 times more lignins than other foods. What are lignins? Lignins are phytoestrogens that can dampen the effects of the body's own estrogen. This is why flax seeds are considered a first-time medical therapy for menstrual breast pain. In terms of breast cancer risk, eating about a daily tablespoonful of ground flax seeds can extend a woman's menstrual cycle by about a day. This means she'll have fewer periods over the course of a lifetime and therefore presumably less estrogen exposure and reduce breast cancer risk. Just as broccoli doesn't technically contain sulforaphane, only the pre- precursors that turn into sulforaphane when chewed. See page 305. Flax seeds don't contain lignans, only the lignin precursors, which need to be activated. This task is performed by the good bacteria in your gut. The gut bacteria role may help explain why women with frequent urinary tract infections may be at higher risk of breast cancer. Every course of antibiotics you take can kill bacteria indiscriminately, meaning it may stymie, STEMI, S-T-Y-M-I-E, the ability of the good bacteria in your gut to take full advantage of the lignans in your diet. Yet another reason you should take antibiotics only when necessary. Lignin intake is associated with significantly reduced breast cancer risk. And yes, that's getting a sticky note. Obviously. Postmenopausal women. This effect... Sorry, let me reread that sentence. With significantly reduced breast cancer risk in postmenopausal women, this effect is presumed to be due to lignans' further estrogen dampening effects. But since lignans are found in healthy foods like berries and whole grains and dark leafy greens, could they su- just be indicators of a healthy diet? In a petri dish, lignans do directly suppress the proliferation of breast cancer cells, but the strongest evidence to date that there really is something special about the class of phytonutrients comes from the interventional trials, starting with a 2010 study funded by the National Cancer Institute. Researchers took about 45 women at high risk of breast cancer, meaning they had suspicious breast biopsies or suspicious breast biopsies, or had previously suffered from breast cancer, and gave them the equivalent of about two teaspoons of ground flax seeds every day. Needle 
biopsies of breast tissue were taken before and after the year-long study. The results, on average, the women had fewer precancerous changes in their breast after a year of flax lignans than before they started. 8%, 36 of 45, had a drop in their levels of KI-67, a biomaker indicator of increased cell proliferation. This finding, proliferation, that's a cool word. I'm going to annotate that. This finding suggests that sprinkling a few spoonfuls of ground flaxseed on your oatmeal or whatever you are eating throughout the day may reduce the risk of breast cancer. What about women who already have breast cancer? Breast cancer survivors who have higher levels of ligaments in their bloodstream and diets appear to survive significantly longer. This outcome may be due to the fact that women who eat flaxseeds may also see a rise in the levels of endostatin endostatin in their breast. Endostatin is a protein produced by your body to help starve tumors of their blood supply. The evidence for the studies like these appeared to appeared so compelling that scientists performed a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial of flax seeds for breast cancer patients. One of the few times a food has ever been so rigorously put to the test. Researchers located women with breast cancer scheduled for surgery and divided them randomly into two groups. Every day, group one ate a muffin containing flax seeds, while group two ate muffin that looked like and tasted the same, but had no flax seeds in it. Biopsies of the tumors in the flax seed and no flax seed groups were taken at the beginning of the study and then compared with the pathology of the tumor removed during surgery about five weeks later. Was there any difference? Compared with the women who ate the placebo muffins, women consuming the muffins with flaxseed on average witnessed their tumor cell proliferation decrease, cancer cell death rates increase, and their CERB2 scores go down. CERB2 is a maker of cancer aggressiveness. The higher your score, the higher the potential for breast cancer to metastasize, metastasize and spread throughout the body. In other words, the flax seeds appear to make the subject's cancer less aggressive. I like the word metastasize, so it's getting a sticky note. The researchers concluded dietary flax seeds has the potential to reduce tumor growth in patients with breast cancer. Flax seeds, which in an expensive and readily available which is inexpensive and readily available, may be potentially a dietary alternative or adjunct to currently used breast cancer drugs, soy and breast cancer. Soybeans naturally contain another class of photoestrogens estrogens called isoflavonoids. <laughs> That's not what they're called. Isoflavonies. I-S-O-F-L-A-V-O-N-E-S. People hear the word estrogen in the world phytoestrogens and in the word phytoestrogens and assume that means soy has estrogen like effects. Not necessarily. Phytoestrogens dock into the same receptors as your estrogen, but have a weaker effect. So they can act to block the effects of your more powerful animal estrogen. There are two types of estrogen receptors in the body alpha and beta. Your own estrogen prefers alpha receptors, while plant estrogens, phytoestrogens, have an affinity for the beta receptors. The if interesting. Your own estrogen prefers alpha receptors. Interesting. The effects of soy phytoestrogens on different tissues therefore depend on the ratio of alpha to beta receptors. Estrogen has positive effects in some tissue and potentially negative effects in others. For example, high levels of estrogen can be good for the bones, but can increase the likelihood of developing breast cancer. Ideally, you'd like what's called a selective estrogen receptor modulator. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> That's an interesting whatever that is, word, phrase. Whatever it is, it's getting a sticky note. Selective estrogen 
receptor modulator in your body that would have pro-estrogenic effects in some tissues. Sorry, in some tissues. Um, where the hell was I? And anti-estrogenic effects in others. Well, that's what soy phytoestrogens appear to be. Soy seems to lower breast cancer risk, an anti-estrogenic effect, but can also help reduce menopausal hot flash symptoms, a pro-estrogenic effect. So by eating soy, you may be able to enjoy the best of both worlds. What about soy for women with breast cancer? There have been five studies on breast cancer survivors and soy consumption. Overall, researchers have found that women diagnosed with breast cancer who ate the most soy live significantly longer and had significantly lower risks of breast cancer re recurrence than those who ate less. The quantity of phytoestrogens found in just a single cup of soy milk may reduce the risk of breast cancer returning by 25%. The improvement in survival for those eating more soy foods was found both in women whose tumors were responsive to estrogen estrogen receptors, positive breast cancer, and those whose tumors were not estrogen receptors, negative breast cancer. This also held true for both young women and older women. In one study, for example, 90% of the breast cancer patients, women who ate the most, who ate the most soy phytoestrogens after diagnosis were still alive after five years while half of those who ate a little to no soy were dead. One way soy may decrease cancer risk and improve survival is by helping to reactivate BRCA genes. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are so-called caretaker genes, cancer-suppressing genes responsible for DNA repair. Mutations in this gene can cause a rare form of hereditary breast cancer. That's getting a sticky note. Okay. As has been well publicized, Anna Gleal Jolie decided to undergo a preventative double mastectomy. Mastectomy. M-A-S-T-E-C-T-O-M-Y. A National Breast Cancer Correlation Survi Survey Co Coalition, coalition, a National Breast Cancer Coalition survey found that the majority of women who believe that most breast cancers occur among women with a family history of genetic predisposition to the disease. The reality is that as few as 2.5% of breast cancer cases are attributed to breast cancer cause cancer running in the family. If the vast majority of the breast cancer patients have fully functional BRCA genes, meaning that their DNA repair mechanisms are intact, how did their breast cancer form grow and spread? Breast tumors appear able to surpass the extension of the gene through the process called methylation, M-E-T-H-Y-L-A-T-I-O-N. While the gene itself is operational, the cancer has effectively turned it off, or at least turned down its expression, potentially aiding the metastatic spread of a tumor. That's where soy may come in. The isoflavones in soy appear to help turn BRCA protection back on. Removing the methyl straitjacket, the tumor tried to place on it. The dose the dose breast cancer researchers used to achieve this result in vitro was pretty hefty, though the equivalent to eating about a cup of soybeans. Soy may help, may also help women with variations of other breast cancer suspective, suspectability. Oh, I'm gonna annotate soybeans. Genes known as MDM2 and CYP1B1 Women at increased genetic risk of breast cancer may therefore especially benefit from high soy intake. The bottom line is that no matter which genes you inherit, changes in your diet may be able to affect DNA expression at a genetic level, potentially boosting your ability to fight disease.
Interesting. Why do women in Asia have less breast cancer? That's a good question. Though breast cancer is the most common cancer specific to women globally, Asian women are up to five times less likely to develop breast cancer than North American women. Why? One possibility is their intake of green tea. A common sta staple in American Asian diets, green tea has been associated with a 30% reduce in breast cancer risk. Another strong possibility is a relatively high intake of soy, which is consumed consistently during childhood, may cut the risk of breast cancer later in life by half. If women consume soy primarily as an adult, though, their risk reduction may be closer to 25%. Sticky notes galore. This chapter is going to be filled with sticky notes. While intake of green tea and soy might account for a twofold reduction in Asian women's breast cancer risk, it doesn't fully account for the disp disparity between Eastern and Western breast cancer rates. Asian populations who also eat more mushrooms, as noted in the box of red wine on page 181, white mushrooms have also been shown to block the estrogen synthesis synthesized en enzyme, at least in petri dishes. So researchers decided to investigate. If there, are, if there was a link between mushroom intake and breast cancer, they compared the mushroom consumption of 1,000 breast cancer patients to 1,000 healthy subjects of similar age, weight and smoking, and exercise status. The women whose mushroom consumption averaged just about one half a mushroom or more per day had 64% lower odds of breast cancer compared with women who didn't eat mushrooms at all. Eating mushrooms and sipping at least half a tea bag's worth of green tea each day was associated with nearly 90% lower breast cancer odds. I like those odds. Oncologists, doctors who treat cancer, can take pride in the strides they've made. Thanks to improvements in cancer treatment, cancer patients are living longer and healthier as has been celebrated in oncology journal ed editorials with such titles as Cancer Survivors 10 Million Strong and Growing. Yes, more than 10 million cancer patients are still alive today, with perhaps as many as 1 million new individuals in the United States joining those ranks each year. That is an accomplishment, but wouldn't it, it be even better to prevent those million cases in the first place? In medicine, a cancer diagnosis is considered a teachable moment. When we can motivate a patient to improve his or her lifestyle, by then, though, it may already be too late. And that's the scary truth. And that was page 197, the last page of chapter 11, How Not to Die from Breast Cancer. I hope you guys liked the video. If you liked the video, leave a like. Support the channel on YouTube. That is the one who cares. The number one who cares. And, uh... Hopefully tomorrow we'll be reading chapter 12, How Not to Die from Suicidal Depression, which is something that is really near and dear to my heart. So I will be reading that tomorrow for sure, and you can count on that. But um, that has been How Not to Die, chapter 11, guys. We are zooming through this book. We're almost halfway done it. We're just about on page 200. There's like 500 pages. So I think the last 100 pages are cliff notes. So it's like 400 pages of this book. And this has been the biggest book I've read and the most enjoyed informational book I've read. Literally profounding, thought-provoking, hilarious. This is a great book, guys. Highly suggest reading How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. Phenomenal reader. He also has another book called How Not to Die It, which we'll be reading in the future as well. So yes, How Not to Die. Chapter 11 is over. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, leave a like. All that fun stuff. Subscribe. Drop a comment. You know, interact with me because I'm lonely and it gets boring sometimes. So, yeah. That's all I got for you guys today. Much love. Love's the only answer. Love's the key. Love's the way. Love's all you need. That's it, guys. Hopefully, you have an amuse. An amuse. What am I even saying? An amazing rest of your night, rest of your morning, whatever time it is for you. And um, take it easy, guys. Don't be too hard on yourself. No one's perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. And that's okay. So, you're perfectly imperfect. Deal with it.
move on, pick yourself back up, learn from your mistakes. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm going to end this video right now because I want to go to bed. But nonetheless, peace out. Take care. Hasta luego. Sayonara. Aloha. Au revoir. Peace. Now I'm going. Right now. I seen something that is floating across that edge. Is it possible that God has been with me? Whole time on this broken set. It's one of the